So good afternoon from Summer Davos. Uh, always the highlight of my agenda and my autumn where we get to bring together uh, global leaders from business, from government, but also importantly at Summer Davos, we bring people from technology, from science, from sustainability to talk about some of the most pressing challenges that we face in the world. And today we're going to talk about earth data. Uh, the title is really uh, a remedy for environmental risk, but I think the debate will actually span a broader agenda than that. Looking at how we manage three, I think, fundamental challenges uh, as we look out over the next five to 10 years, which is how we continue to grow our global economy, to drive economic development, to drive wealth, the jobs and the growth that benefits citizens and, uh, and society as a whole, how we reconcile that with the sustainability challenges that we have globally from an environmental perspective, from a social perspective, from a governance perspective, laid out in the global goals uh, that the UN has adopted to 2030. And then thirdly, how we weave the power, the benefits that are emerging of technology and scientific breakthroughs uh, as we really enter the fourth industrial revolution. How digital technologies, physical technologies, biological technologies can be used uh, and can actually really benefit our ability to create that sustainable growth model of the future. And at the heart of that, or at the heart of so many of those discussions, is data. And how data, if you take the uh, example of The Economist, is the new oil. If oil and coal were the first, for the first industrial revolution, data is going to power the fourth industrial revolution. And what I would like to get from today, with the help of the audience, is insights from the panel about how it is that data uh, in itself, but also new ways of analyzing, new ways of slicing and dicing and using data to provide insight to policymakers, to business, to citizens, can really help us tackle those challenges. And I'm really pleased to be joined by a fascinating panel that's going to be able to uh, really tackle that from a number of different lenses. Uh, firstly, Ursula Muller, who's the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs uh, and the Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator at the United Nations. And as we were just talking about, um, for those of you who don't know this, you know, actually her group is the group that coordinates across all of the UN agencies to think about how the UN both raises money for emergency situations, but also how it goes about bringing the UN ecosystem in very, very tough situations around the world to help solve problems of relief. Uh, I'm also joined now, at lunchtime I saw this messed up, so I'm going to just simply refer to it as a CP group. Um, but I'm also joined by Olivia Shu, who is the uh, Chief Technology Officer at um, CP Group. For those of you who don't know, it's probably, if you don't know, it's probably the biggest company in the world that you don't know. Uh, a $50 billion food-based agricultural consumer goods business uh, with far-reaching supply chains and distribution chains in global food systems. Very interested in issues like food security. Uh, and then the third... Person that I'm going to introduce is a good friend of mine, Bruno Sanchez Andrade Nuno. Even I have to read his name, even though we've known each other for a while. Um, but also a fantastic, a fantastic um, translator, I think, in terms of science, in terms of physics. Actually, probably responsible for one of the most interesting sessions. I'm not just saying that that I've ever attended with WEF, uh, which is we all use the term too lightly and too often that it's not rocket science. Well, actually, Bruno is a rocket scientist, <laughs> and he actually held a fantastic session in Geneva, still one of my highlights, which was actually explaining how rocket science. And if you can get it through to someone like me as a non-scientist, uh, I think you'll benefit from his insights today. And another good friend. Finally, Jane Plunkett, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer in Asia and a member of the Group Executive Committee for Swiss Ray, uh, one of the world's, if not the world's largest reinsurers, a fascinating authority on really the disruption taking place in many different fields of insurance and reinsurance and the technology backbone that's enabling you to think about risk and to help people manage risk, whether it's at country level or business level, uh, in different ways. So lots of good applications. I think of, of how we think about data in the context of different elements of sustainability, from disasters to food security to the technology enablers to insurance and reinsurance. So let me start off just by 
asking you the first question, what's really going on in your space? What are you doing around data? What is interesting? What would you call out as being sort of the cutting edge and the potential for data to disrupt positively your sector? It's not sector, I guess, your, your sphere of influence. <laughs> Well, great to be here to find some, uh, discuss technological innovations to, for sustainable development, but also to respond to humanitarian needs. When the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs puts together the global humanitarian overview, what are the global humanitarian needs for, nine, for this year? They are put at two, 25 billion US dollars to meet the needs of 134 million people. So how does this um, trickle down? How do, we assess, how do we collect the data? How do we analyze? How do we make the data relevant for decision makers? First of all, we have to collect the data in the field by looking at conflict, disaster predictions, and um, I share with you a very simple example because I know we are going into outer space when you collect the data with satellites. For instance, we monitored prices of goats in Somalia. They were going <laughs> down. And UNHCR could predict the population movement into Kenya and address the needs that are arising there from the population movement. And the price of goats, believe it or not, went up in Kenya and down in Somalia. So this is a very simple way of collecting data. The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs also has a humanitarian data center in The Hague. The purpose is really to collect data, to make data available for decision makers, and we invite partners to also um, contribute to the data sharing. So 65 million people today on the globe forcibly displaced is just a huge number. So we have to be very predictive in, in um, analyzing this data to make them really relevant for, for decision makers. Climate, every day we see climate induced um, challenges, drought, displacement. How do we predict a famine? It's a great um, success of the United Nations system and the humanitarian partners that we were able to stave off a famine in northeastern Nigeria, South Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen due to indicators. And uh, sort of we did the fundraising. We raised the alarm bells. Actually, it was the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, ringing the alarm bells. as a looming famine. And in the 21st century, we should be able to prevent a famine. So, of course, this was uh, anal um, data that was uh, credible to do a big fundraising and what effort. kinds of data? What would, you, what would you go after? How would you collect it to be able to have predictive analytics? Well, for instance, the nutrition situation of the people. Huh? Um, are there stunted children? Um, is there enough food? What is the production of the crops like? Mm -hmm. so you still need uh, human capacity um, to, to put together the data. So it's a lot of partners in the, in the field. Yes. And, and actually, that's not a bad segue into your industry, which is around food right. and food security. Uh, I mean, or at least a lot of the concerns in your industry around things like traceability, around provenance, customers having different uh, concerns around food security and security of supply. H how are some of the data trends, what are some of the most important trends in terms of new technologies and approaches? How are you thinking about data as CTO? I think uh, data is very, very important for us. So not only just food data, but also employee data. And I can mention that in a second. Let's focus on food. If you like a food, a food traceability is a very burning issue. And uh, we as a company, because we said we're from the upstream, from the seed to the farm and to the uh, animal feed, to the animal farm, and to the, to the factory that uh, really make ready-to-eat food, into the retail store. So we're like a full, uh, a full chain. So, so you think that it's very easy for us to utilize data. Actually not, because every single um, transaction is located, the data is stored, the data is there, and you really need to put a conscious effort to bring all the data together. Mm -hmm. And that's for food uh, traceability. And uh, we as a company, we are really committed to do the green ecosystem. And we, when we say green, meaning we want to build a real waste, zero waste farms. And I use that example like a chicken farm, not only just do the chicken farm, all the waste water go to the vegetable garden, not vegetable farms next to it, using the heat from the, from the chicken to dry the manure and to make sure that the, the manure can be, trans, can be given to the other farms. And then we have a robots 
going through our uh, chicken farm, which is one of them is only uh, 50 miles away from here, produce 2.3 million eggs every day. We only employ the 23 people. The rest of them are all automated. That means that when you put the food and everything through the automated system, that means you collect data, you examine data, then the food can be safe. So this is what I'm saying. Is that this is the whole supply chain, and then we have all the data about our food uh, traceability, and we're building the system to connect all the dots, and then you can scan the QR code well, to and, do it. And I think it's, you know, that, that is, you increasingly see in a world where if data is the new oil, you know, that currency is becoming more and more important, the ability to gather more data from more different sources, structured, unstructured. And Bruno, let me turn to you um, as my favorite WEF science geek. Um, so <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are some of the technology breakthroughs? What are some of the technologies that you're seeing that are most promising uh, for using digital means to gather data and to solve outcomes that are better for citizens, better for consumers, better for sustainability? Yep, so, um in, in particular, in other industry, in space, um, at our company, Satellogic, we see a revolution in... So can you just say briefly what the, the, the business is about? Satellite technology? Yeah. So, so we build, basically build uh, our own satellites in Argentina, and then we launch them and operate them. And then this is the key part that we believe is not about the data. It's about the answers. It's about the solutions. So, of course, the worst thing you can have is no data. But probably the second worst thing is too much data. Mm -hmm. Especially in the age of big data, when you have a lot of things you can do with your data, it's extremely easy to get lost in yep. the possibilities, right? Yep. So when someone, a company, uses data, they use it for a purpose. And when we are producing this amount of data, like with our satellites, then we're not saying, okay, this is data, you can use it. What we focus more and more is in solutions, is in answers, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not about... I, I think there's going to be a revolution that from big data, we're going to talk about big indicators. Because big data is, has, has maybe too much, we can, you can get lost with the possibilities. You need indicators, you need answers. And big data, of course, can provide these answers, but it's about the context where this happens. When the chickens are getting, getting using infrared cameras and all these things, there's a lot of data you could do with that, which is besides the, what you're using for. But you have a real, real concrete scope for that data. And that's the thing we are seeing happening more and more in the industry in general. So does that mean for a business like you yours that actually the really key insight in terms of having impact is not so much about the hardware, it's more about the software. It's about the ability to determine signal versus noise you know, in exactly. that data. Is All that of it. All of it. And we, when you are vertically integrated, like for example in, in your company, you can do a lot of um, you can get a lot of benefits from, from being integrated. In our case, for example, we can do this cloud computing, but on the satellites. It's like cloud, but even higher, right? And that allows us to really focus on these answers. And this is key for... for I mean, give us a very specific use case for the satellite data that's, that's aligned with this sustainability. You, you might not need images from your pipeline. You want to know when they break. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, you buy images every day of your pipeline. Now you can say, hey, tell me when it breaks. Mm -hmm. They predict it. But of course, there are many cases in humanitarian response, mm. social impact, and many others. Broken pipelines, that sounds like an infrastructure <laughs> insurance risk. That sounds yeah. like one for Jane. So same for you. Uh, as you think about you know, what are the breakthroughs, what technologies are enabling you to think differently about helping people manage risk in your industry? I might start by saying, what problem are we trying to solve? Because you asked at the beginning about growing our economies and pro providing more uh, sustainability and sus uh, sustainable jobs for people. And when we look at the insurance industry, the, the pity that we find is that there's too much uninsured risk in the world. And we would be happy to bring that uninsured risk into the safety net of the insurance industry. And so part of what helps us to do that is a better understanding of data. But it's probably important to put that into context first. So if we look at uh, just the simple case of natural disasters, if you look across Asia alone, there were some 31 billion US dollars of economic losses last year from nat natural disasters. And less than 80% of that, or sorry, eight, eight, more than 80% of that is uninsured. So that's the problem. When we see the typhoon coming, it's easy to think about what is this going to cost society. Um, what we worry about is why isn't more of that insured? Because by, by insuring it, it puts people back to work more quickly. And um, certainly the capital is around in the insurance industry and the solutions are there uh, to do that. And so data helps us. 
um, to understand the risk more clearly, um, and also to understand the weather patterns and how the weather patterns are changing over time and in what different areas. It also helps us in terms of understanding cities because with urbanization, we have more and more people moving into cities, um, which are also tend to be closer to more severe weather. So understanding this landscape is important in terms of ensuring it. And, and give us an example. I mean, what kind of products would big data influence? So if I'm you know, a, a mayor of a city or I'm the CEO of a major corporation, you know, perhaps with an oil and gas, how would, it, how would it change what I buy, the way I interact with you, the way it helps me manage risk? So we have a few, uh, we have many good examples of, of things uh, for cities in particular, and they tend to be around natural disasters. Um, so we often create products that are called parametric, which is basically a fancy word for saying that if X happens, then you get Y payout. Uh, so it's very specific. It doesn't require someone to go on site and look at it. So in other words, if a typhoon with a certain wind speed hits, then the government automatically gets a payout of an agreed amount, which they can then distribute to the community. Very good example, very tangible, thank you. So this is the open fire round where you get to answer the questions, whichever one you would like to. But, but give me a sense, at least in each of your areas, you've, I think, listed four fascinating areas, all of which I think are at that intersection that we talked about in terms of technology, sustainability, and, and economics. Um, when you think about scale and speed of the use of data to produce better outcomes for citizens, for consumers, customers, for society, what would be the most important accelerator from your perspective? Anyone think, who'd like to, please? I think it's one. communication. I would like to share an example. For instance, when the earthquake in Mexico hit, or the um, floods in um, Indonesia, it was also a Chinese company, Huai Hua, who put up the telecommunication to share the information. So this enabled really the rapid response uh, to search for the people in the earthquake uh, or to really see where are the vulnerable peoples, people. So this is for the really very important telecommunication, mobile systems to collect the data to make them really relevant for Connectivity which decision. Connectivity and communication is very helpful, yeah. I would say that employee data, especially employee skills, because if you look at the five years down the road or 10 years down the road, artificial intelligence and many technology will change our job. Yes. And I really understand the skill set of your, your employees and identify mm -hmm. the areas they need to be retrained yes. and make sure that they will have a job and they will have the skill set to, to be successful in the next five to 10 years, extremely important. And also uh, to identify the young talent who has the right mentality and also the right skill set to lead us through this Industrial four point transformation, digital transformation is extremely important for us as a business. I think that's a great example. I mean, at least at Accenture, I would reflect that. Um, so, our chief technology officer, your sort of uh, mm -hmm. your brother in arms in our yes. business, at least, wrote a book recently called Human and Machine. And I think understanding um, the way in which work is going to be disrupted and move away from roles to tasks, some of which will be automated, some of which will be elevated where people are more capable because they have access to data and analytics, others which will be truly still human or much more creative. And then thinking about how you plan the workforce and think about skills and identifying those gaps, I think will be a major element of sustainable development. Either we will have sustainable economic systems and models for job creation or not. Um, anyone else, the, the accelerators? I, I was going to say, I think maybe the mixture of skill sets, um, because you know we work in the insurance industry, but we're using all this data and all these applications from from other places, and so you know it's only certain people that work that maybe are driven to work in the insurance industry if they don't realize that we use all this data to begin mm -hmm. with. So I think this mixture of industries, um, and maybe just to give you an example of of how we use it, um, we use, for example, we use satellite data. Um, to look at uh, all, the, all the crops uh, to know how they're performing um, and also to use the weather data to know what the rainfall is. And then we're able, we have a live program in Kenya where we're able to send signals to farmers to say, please check on the livestock because they probably aren't getting the right food uh, these days, which yes. is then affecting the food production. Yeah. So I think if you don't realize that we do these kinds of things, you probably wouldn't come and work in the insurance industry, but it's more interesting than you might think. Well, and, and that links, I think, also back to Ursula's point about communications when you talk about the farming community. But 
doesn't that opportunity open up, or sorry, doesn't that, that um, open up a whole new wave of opportunities for you to use data that you may already have with different partners in ways that you haven't explored before? I mean, is that something you're actively looking at? I mean, reinsurance is probably one of the biggest gatherers of data in the world on, on certain topics anyway. Is that something you've looked at? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have um, you know, massive amounts of data as an industry on, on all kinds of different things. Um, but as, as technology impacts our daily lives, it's important to have other kinds of data too. And maybe motor insurance is a good example of that. Um, you all know, we, have the, we know kind of how you drive, what your age is, these kinds of things. Um, but now we can also use contextual data about where you're driving and what the roads look like to help us know what, what kind of conditions you're driving under. Well, you know a lot more about the way I drive probably than I know <laughs> about the way I drive. So there has to be a sort of smart mashup there of technologies. You were going to talk about the acceleration. I wanted to reflect that I think all of us are, are orbiting around the same idea of the right people with the right skills. Yes. And in fact, if you think about it, it is in the integrated businesses like yours or the in insurance businesses or maybe the defense business where there is this combination of getting the data for a purpose. And what I think is needed is, and I, I, we talk about this um, often, is, is the, to reframe a little bit what a scientist is. There is not someone who is in academia doing research for making purpose. It's not about the fourth decimal point on climate change. It's about how to drive those insights into action. And this is something the insurance company, of course, has figured out. This is something the verticality integrated businesses are, for, of course, figured out. Yeah. And, for example, the Navy in the U.S., their assets are 90% around the coast, and they're going to be affected by climate change. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they know how to start doing these things. So, to me, a key part of this is to reframe this this um, value of the scientists closer to the solutions, yeah. closer to analyze the data for the, the focus of having an impact. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think the other thing that's interesting about data is it doesn't respect the ways in which we've organized our traditional industries or business exactly. models. You know, so it, it, it actually has a habit of flowing around those. And if you actually want to get to the right outcome and the right end game, it often takes an ecosystem you know, beyond the boundaries of your organization, including the scientists, including you know, other non-traditional partners that can actually help you to make breakthroughs in delivering better outcomes for citizens and for consumers. So. Um, in a second, I'm just going to turn to you guys uh, and ask for, um, for comments and questions. Uh, I have a time for about, four, oh, this is, I love this phrase, you have time for about four or five uh, questions or one long-winded self-indulgent indulgent speech. So <laughs> let's, go, let's go with five, let's go for five questions. But before I do that, um, let me bring in Anne from the uh, World Economic Forum's Fourth Industrial Revolution Center, because one of the goals of this session and a number of debates like it that are taking place is to think about how that network can pick up themes like this and produce the breakthroughs in terms of global collaboration on data that would drive us forward on economic development and sustainability. So, Anne, do you want to just say a few words on what you've heard? Peter, um, I wanted to start by actually offering you an alternative metaphor. Um, so you were referring to data as the new oil, yes. and I like to refer to data as the oxygen that fuels technological innovation. Um, so I'm, I'm Ann Toth, I'm the head of data policy at the World Economic Forum's Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, we were founded 18 months ago, and one of our very first projects was what we refer to as 4IR for the Earth, or the ways in which we look at the applications of all of the technologies of the Fourth Industrial Revolution um, in in service of or in of solving the problems that are uh, facing us with respect to the environment and the earth. Um, so we have in our data policy portfolio really sort of two very specific types of problems. One is the hyper-aggregation of a lot of data in the hands of very few organizations. And the flip side of that is um, data that's sort of an inch deep and a mile wide. Uh, and it's really uh, looking at specifically humanitarian use cases, um, disaster relief, um, research, where we find that actually the problem is not enough data, not aggregated quickly enough. And so really that's the area that we're looking at, uh, the intersection of 4IR for the Earth with data policy at the center. And so this conversation is really timely and important for the work we're doing. So thank you for that. And I know you need to run, um, Anne, in a second, but, but I think if others have ideas that they think would merit attention from the 4II Center on this topic, I think, is an open-mindedness about Absolutely, what kind absolutely. Of and I actually bring with me um, a fellow who's working with us at the center, Annie Brett, who is uh, working on the data project as well as an oceans project at the center. Uh, so, so she will be here throughout and uh, look forward to engaging with all of you on this topic. So thank you. 
Excellent. So, no time for any long-winded speeches, but plenty of time for good questions. Please start. Thank you very much and for being here. And do introduce yourself as well. Yeah, please. my name is Carlo Papa. I'm the managing director of a research center fully founded by one of the biggest electricity companies in the world and a board member of the United Nations Alliance for Resiliency. And uh, my question is, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, speeches. I, I have a problem uh, that I need to fix. Uh, that, uh, you know, everyone is talking about collecting data. I'm talking with people in UN, uh, with a big insurance company and my own industry. And uh, when I say, and I pointed out the attention that we should share more data, not essentially with my mom or with my kids, but among, uh, you know, infrastructure owners, insurance and insurer of a certain side, I tend to find barrier. And uh, at least in our value chain, speaking about food or speaking about, uh, you know, per value chain, we should consider the subject because uh, I think we, we, it's uh, where the real value is and where we can lower the amount of investment of actually ex ex exploiting those data. Thank you. Very good. Not everyone has to, but if one or two people want to pick up the question. I, th I think that one of the challenges of sharing data is uh, too much detail preventing us to share data, even within the same uh, company. So my suggestion is we distill the data into characteristics. I call the truth. Uh, the truth is, for example, when you go to the United States, they shouldn't ask you which year you were born. They should ask you, are you 21 or not? Yes, you, you're given. And then I would say that, is this a bottle versus all the detailed parameters of the bottle? Is this a, a organic food? Uh, it really doesn't matter is it chicken manure or cow manure. So it's really the abstraction uh, called the persona data should be shared, not about the detailed PI data. If we can develop that kind of a common language, then I think data can flow. Actually, it's a fact, the truth. It's not a fact, it's the truth can flow. And we should build a data sharing community around the, the truth not about the detailed data. Uh, and Elizabeth and I attended another session earlier, which I think speaks a lot to, to your point, which is to say uh, we were talking about sustainable production systems. We we're talking about things like the circular economy. And I do think there is a role um, for clusters of companies, government actors, non-government actors to come together to establish good data governance good standards and sharing practice, because one of the things that we're seeing around some of those spaces is the lack of comparability uh, or the lack of um, easy plug and play, and also the duplication, which has all sorts of uh, negative ramifications in terms of things that aren't uh, able to emerge by way of innovative solutions, but also even things like having five or six different cloud platforms working on one technology in the cloud actually uses energy and is all sorts of uh, you know, negative consequences there. So I think there is definitely a need for that. So other questions, please. Please. And please say who you are. Hi, everyone. My name is Karuna. Sorry. Um, I am a global shaper from Mauritius. Now, you have to stop there, because I was a YGL a long time ago, and you guys have totally usurped us. <laughs> you know, we, we, you're all bright and new and innovative. We're like, we don't feel like young global leaders anymore with these shapers anymore. <laughs> uh, so my question is a bit linked. Um, well, it's, it's a very simple question that may be linked to the previous question, which is, are more and more consumers want to consume sustainably? And if you're going, to the, uh, to the shop, if you're going shopping, for example, how would you know what what is the product that has the least environmental impact? Right. And that is a question that I keep asking myself because um, Elida and I know a lot of people who want to consume sustainably, but they don't know where to start. So I'd like to ask, what, what is a good starting point in terms of comparing, especially fast-moving consumer goods, and how do we also ensure that that data is credible? How do we get industries to give that data and ensure that it's credible? I think that's Thank a great you. question, from data to knowledge to insight that's actionable as a consumer so you can actually make choices, yeah. And it doesn't need to be necessarily on fast-moving consumer goods. I think that's true across almost every aspect of, of what we buy you know, by way of goods and services. How do you determine what's sustainable, what's not sustainable? How do you make sense of data? I think that should be just traceability. I think a traceability with the red data and also we need, we as a, all the human beings on the earth need to come up with a, the right measurement. Like at lunchtime, we talk about 
the waste, the cost of waste, and maybe uh, the cost of the all sorts of chemical in the food uh, producing uh, process that we need to have them, such model that everyone recognizes. That is the cost. That doesn't come for free. Well, and I think there's that. I think that traceability piece, and I, I know you've worked on this somewhat, um, Bruno, but, but also what we're seeing in sustainability is science-based targets. So businesses moving away from setting sustainability targets. You, you talked earlier about, for example, your energy goal per you know, dollar of, of, of product. Right. Um, you know, I think that helps a lot, that we actually have verification of scientists, again, bringing in clusters of other actors to be able to verify and to bring that trust uh, that, that actually you're making informed decisions. Brenner, sorry. Yeah, I think that's coming. I, I'm pretty sure that's coming partly because of the millennial generation who are more keen to know where the things come from. It used to be like maybe wines and a few other products that you really wanted to know where it came and that's what provided the value. But I really think that it's, it's coming because of that care about the environment. It's, you want to know what is, what is not only the environmental footprint, the CO2, but also the value of knowing this comes from your region because you want it closer. There are technologies that are helping make this happen. Of course, the hype blockchain technology allows to do this in a transparent way. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that is happening just like the knowing what the nutritional value was uh, came yeah. through. I think this is coming too. So the more we can help do that, asking for it to our brands, the, the faster it's going to happen. Well, and I think what you've brought up, I can see Omar, um, one of my colleagues at Accenture, you've used this term a lot, the idea of combinatorial impact of technologies. I think this is a good example where you end up with the combinatorial impact because you've got that ability to hold blockchain-based distributed ledger uh, sort of um, programs in the cloud. Um, and increasingly, we see the logarithmic cost reduction of sensors, for example, yes. to the point where we can actually embed those in products that are ever less expensive that make that traceability possible, or even one innovation we heard of today, actually moving the entire barcode system globally. There's now a standards organization that's come together to make sure that that actually is available. Every single product would have its own unique website with the traceability data, which removes the need to actually even invest in RFID or sensor technology in the product. So I, I think that cluster of technologies it enables things to be done differently. Other questions, please? I have one for you, which is, um, at Accenture, we talk often about the idea of making a wise pivot in terms of digital transformation. And to some extent, each of you are talking about digital transformations using data in each of your different fields, you know, whether or not it's humanitarian or food or satellites or insurance. Um, and always there's the challenge of moving from what already works and people feel comfortable with to brave new worlds that, that sometimes work out for the better but also have unintended consequences. So you have to manage a very human transition as well as manage the shift in investment to new technologies, new ways of doing things. In each of your settings and organizations, how is that wise pivot playing out? What are the barriers and enablers to managing both the investment and human dimensions of the wise pivot? I think that's a great question because looking at the humanitarian sector, we are far behind the private sector and all these innovations and uh, data, big data. But I still believe we have to apply human judgment. With all the data that's out there, uh, it has to be relevant data, it has to be analyzed, and it has to be shared. And there uh, are also these concerns about privacy. If we collect data for, on refugees, for instance, and share all this data, health and whatever, uh, for, with the insurance company, I think the, the governance structure, which was mentioned before, is really very important to get the standards, the governance structure, the speed, and to uh, provide and share relevant data and use human judgment. Mm -hmm. I think the human empathy is very important because uh, the, the, the biggest factor between artificial intelligence and the human are the human empathy. That human can go beyond data, go beyond the inside. That's why we don't give the button of a nuclear weapon to a machine, but rather a human, because a human will make decisions based on the data, but also the love and the empathy. It's probably not a good right example because we could argue that some humans may, may not necessarily make it perfectly on evidence-based decision know. making, but, 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 I, not by one but I take your point. Yes. <laughs> very good. I'm, as a scientist, it's very hard to say this, but I think it really is the key. It's not only about data. You could have the perfect data-driven 
option might not be the right option because of history reasons, moral reasons, religion reasons. There are many factors that influence the right decisions. Right. And sometimes the politics, the diplomacy, all these things take precedent even over the data, which is hard to accept as scientists. Imagine, for example, a vaccine that is based on pig protein. And then massive people wouldn't want to do it, right? Yes. Because it comes from a pig. There are, there are cases where even saying data-driven is not probably the right approach. Data-informed is probably the more better approach. If there was big oil and we had another... I like oil, oxygen you know, better than oil. That I would, was a good I would uh, say it's uh, the new soil. The, the new soil. place where you can start making decisions. To grow and fertilize exactly. ideas. The yeah. new soil for like making it. decisions. Well, and I, and I think what... What you also realize, two things that came out of our lunch. We had Andy Burnham, who's the mayor of, um, of uh, Manchester in the UK. And he, he, did, he sort of gently looked around to all of us in the audience. Many of, of, of us are sort of economists or scientists and, and sort of said, look, don't focus on the, the data. Don't focus on the sort of technical inward looking conversation. Focus on what the outcome is going to be for a citizen or for a consumer that otherwise wouldn't be achievable if you didn't have that kind of enabling context. And that's what will allow you to move large groups of people and avoid the backlash that we have seen in other examples where technologies and science breakthroughs were right but weren't accepted by society. And we've seen that again and again and again. The wise pivot, Jane, insurance. Yeah, maybe I'll come back to your original question, which is um, if you think about our industry, and the, there's many industries that are similar to us, where we use a lot of historical data to try to say what the future looks like. And this has served us really well as an industry for a long time. But it's not so easy anymore because the historical patterns are not always as predictive of the future as they used to be. And that has to do with the fact that uh, the pace of change is just very different. We have different variables coming into play, like we talked about all the techni uh, uh, technology plays. And so part of that pivot is realizing that we can always use the history, because it's important that we know that, whether that's you know, st statistical history like I look at or, or other kinds of history. But we have to think about what it looks like in the future, and that's where predictive analytics and taking uh, simulation and other kinds of data comes into play. And that can be a hard leap for people who've been doing for, for years and years historical analysis on data. And, and, and I imagine not just hard for your people, but hard to take the customer on the journey as well. Do you see very different pockets of receptivity amongst your customer base to, to move it towards more data-driven approaches? It can be customers. It can also be a question of regulatory uh, guidelines as well, because uh, everything we do has, is governed and has to be regulated by an entity. And so being able to, to show historical experience versus what you think the future might look like uh, is not always an easy task either. So yeah. it's not uh, insurmountable, but it's, that's a challenge. Well, I think that's a really good um, segue into what I'm going to ask you last, but, but I think the, the ability to move an entire stakeholder environment rather than just your own organization, whether that's customers or regulators or partners, you know, in a digital transformation such as some of the ones we're talking about in terms of big data and analytics-driven insights and the way that you make decisions through value chains in, in the global economy, I think that actually is a real issue of the wise pivot, but in an extensive sense, not just simply within your own four walls. Um, so I'm going to finish off by allowing each of you a two-minute segment, a one to two-minute segment. If I say 30 seconds, it will be two minutes. Um, so a short intervention on what you think is the most important insight from your industry in terms of what people need to get right to make sure that big data and analytics truly is driving impact and outcomes for citizens and society in each of the four areas that you've talked about in terms of humanitarian aid, food security, um, satellites, and, uh, and, and insurance. Data matters. That, uh, two, that works too. And, and you've got, you can elaborate a little yeah. on the, why it matters so much. Accurate data matters. Mm -hmm. Relevant data matters. Data sharing is very important. We need to have standards. We need to have the governance to overcome the impediments that were mentioned by the audience, also on uh, the reluctance to share data. There's privacy concerns. And we need to be faster. Speed in data analysis matters. We need um, 
to have the to have aggregated data to be able to design our humanitarian response in natural disasters, but also trends over time in protracted crises um, where people are in humanitarian needs for decades sometimes because of conflict. Um, and we have to have sector aggregated data. Is it food, health, protection, whatever um, the needs are? Mm -hmm. So the humanitarian sector also has to adapt to be more data um, knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. It is new skills that the humanitarian actors have to develop and also the systems have to be more flexible. Very good, thank you. I would say that the uh, data collection and the definite data aggregation is very important, but more importantly to use those data to extract an actionable uh, insight and also to predict the future. As you said, that uh, the past is a part of the future, but it's not all of the future. So, and then to use those kind of models for us to predict the impact of a policy about you know, any kind of a marketing event that we're gonna push forward. For example, facial recognition, some people think is cool. Some people think is, uh, is a invade our privacy. So we need to really understand not only just data and uh, aspect our own good, but a human nature. What would be the technology impact to the human nature? Yeah, we collect data, we take care of data very carefully, and um, we want to be very responsible for our data. Don't use data just only for our own purpose. We're, as a company, we say society. Uh, we want to make sure our data serves our society, our country, and then our uh, company and our employees. And our customer is not only just a customer. We need to think about beyond our own customer, think about the society. Mm. I would say that I think it's clear we live in a world that is more and more dominated by data. Mm. And probably less and less people actually understand the implications of that data. Mm -hmm. So I think it's key to, to figure out that problem out. And part of figuring this out is to realize, I would say that for a long time, data has been the source of a lot of value, especially from the scientific community, academic community. Then came the private sector, the technology companies with data science and big data, and they were able to extract a lot of value. And part of that key was to pull from answers rather than push with curiosity or with data. That mindset needs to change in many places mm -hmm. from governments, public sector, private sector, and that probably means putting the right people with the right skills in governments, in NGOs, in the Tech community already has this, this chief data, chief scientist. We need that change more because we need to really figure out what are the consequences of this world more and more dominated with data. Hmm. Very interesting. I think, um, I mean, it's interesting because we've had data for, since the beginning of time, right? <laughs> so, so actually having data is not something new. Uh, it's more the volume of data that we have now and how we use it. And you said something at the beginning about data is the new oil. There's a reason you use that phrase. It's because it's a valuable resource, right? That's a reason you use that phrase. And so I think that's probably the thing we all have to just realize that that's going to take a bit of work and a lot of thought to think about the fact that it's a valuable resource. That means it's valuable to individuals. That means it's valuable to companies. It's sometimes their competitive advantage. Um, and it's valuable to governments, and it's valuable that we share it. But how do we make all these worlds work together? It's, it's not so clear in all circumstances. So, so I do think that that takes, uh, I think that's, you say how do we accelerate it? I think probably understanding that, that it is a valuable resource, and that means that um, people will treat it in different ways is probably the most important thing. And I think that's a brilliant segue to finish, which is actually that, um, that sense in which you said sometimes data will be valuable and will, you know, will, will relate to your competitiveness. I think what we see at Accenture is that that's ever more the case um, and that actually data will be absolutely integral to almost all industries, if not all industries in terms of competitive dynamics. Um, and as I was writing down all the things that you were saying, uh, I was thinking, well, actually, I like the oxygen analogy that oxygen, that data is 
is the new oxygen that is going to fuel economic development. And the economic development we know, at least for now, is measured in GDP. But I think this is a very different GDP for data. It's about data governance, the G. So it's about making sure we have transparent governance of data that allows us to focus on the end game for society, for citizens, uh, for end consumers, that allows us to collaborate effectively in ecosystems to turn that data into real insight, actionable insight that changes models, that changes the products and services or the outcomes that we deliver. Um, you also talked a lot about dynamism and the dynamism of data, that it needs to be fast, it needs to be scalable, it needs to be aggregated, that we need to have it as a flexible value and resource that we can use and adapt to different settings. And importantly, we need to understand the difference between the signal and the noise and to be able to find our way through the enormous amount of data that we have and make sure we don't get lost in that and we produce real outcomes. And then finally, it's about about pivots. It's about pivoting societies, it's about pivoting organizations, it's about pivoting your customer uh, and the ecosystem that you require around you in many cases to actually enable the new. And so I would say hopefully what you've taken away and hopefully what the 4IR Center take away as food for thought uh, or oxygen as fuel for the fourth industrial revolution is the revolution that data causes in GDP and hopefully the way we think about empowering and enabling a sustainable global economy in the next decade. Many thanks to all of you. Many thanks to my panelists. Thank you. Thank you.